seen or Sharon, a long time member here at Northside. So or to me and myself. I'll get to review the video a hundred times. Oh, we're videoing? No. <laughs> you didn't tell me that. Next YouTube presentation. <laughs> hey. <laughs> well, hey, thanks for the invite. You know, I'm always always happy to share a little bit of what I've learned uh, through the years. And I think if there's only one thing that you go home with tonight, it's what I'm going to talk about, about the light side and the dark side of the face. Now, somebody in the front row's job is that if I happen to get into my little bright brain and I'm painting and not talking, you know, the key is Sharon, wake up. So somebody keep me on track. <coughs> You know, everything that we see is only because of the light and the way it casts the light on the form. If you walk into a perfectly dark room, you could run into something right in front of you because there is no light to give form to that object. It's not any different on the face. When the light hits a part of the face, there's always a shadow that's cast, and it is the consequence of that light and how we mimic that on our canvas that ends up making any painting, in particular, a portrait. So if you know that there are certain things that you need to look for, to pay attention to, your mind will quit using the symbols that it makes for eyes, nose, mouth, ears. You know, our brain is the most overworked organ in our body. If you're walking through the woods and a tree is falling down, that brain cannot say, oh, that's a weeping willow coming towards you versus a huge sycamore. So what it does is it compartmentalizes things and starts creating these symbols. Now, when we start painting, instead of analytically looking at something and evaluating what it really is, we have a tendency to let these symbols start taking over we start painting what we think we know instead of being analytical, instead of paying attention to vertical plumb lines, horizontal guidelines. This is as compared to that. It's not that this eye is so far over. We has to have to start talking in our gibberish. We can't say it's an eye because then our mind will want to start making that little kindergarten eye that we we grew up with. So becoming very analytical in a somewhat creative way is what our challenge is. It's not a matter of putting paint on the canvas. If I gave all of you paint chips of a different color and a palette and brushes, you could end up matching those paint chips and we could put them together in the semblance of a face. So it's not the technical skill of putting it on the canvas. It is the ability to learn to look a little bit differently. Some of you have been here before and probably heard me talk about the little symbols that we do make up in order to try to come up with certain things that you're going to look for in every face. Because the skull has a bony mass underneath it, and then we have um, muscle and connective tissue and fat and skin over it, there is a basic structure. Everybody has a place where their forehead turns back to the side. When we paint, we have a tendency to want to make it look like a pancake or a pie plate. It's not. It's like it's a loaf pan going back. So if we think about this, that there's a hook on everybody that outlines the orbit of their eye and the turn of their forehead. Anytime you look at somebody and you say, well, where's their hook at? You look at it differently than forehead. The other thing that's interesting is of all the facial features, the forehead is the one and only thing that we do not have a preconceived symbol for in our little library of symbols. So if you are a new portrait artist, it is always good to start with the shape of the forehead because we don't automatically go, this is a forehead. We'll look at it and go, oh, this forehead, and here's the hairline, and, and we will be analytical with that beginning piece. So we always have the hook, this little W. The W denotes the deepest part of the face right here. The point 
where it meets here will always be a crease with the eyelid, uh, eyelid crease. Not the lid, but the eyelid crease. Everybody has a fatty part on their tissue. It does not matter whether you're man, woman, any ethnic group, there is what we call the pear shape. If you think about that as a pear, you'll always be able to denote the fullness of the face here. It's more evident in a smile, but it's even apparent in a non-smile. So, the nose. The nose and the mouth, the two biggest obstacles that we have in painting a portrait. If we think of this nose, the bottom edge of it, as a bird, a flying bird, instead of, here's the bottom of the nose, how the heck do I do that? So, if we put that line in gracefully, and then right above it, make the little body of the bird, we will be able to develop the bottom plane of the nose without having the little pig snout that we oftentimes think of with the two little holes and around. We will avoid that whole situation. So the mouth, this is the expression line of the whole face no matter what your expression is. It starts from the bottom um, line of your mouth. It's the darkest part in the face and the corners, and if we put that in more like a graceful line, I think about it like a seagull, we will not get off track too fast. It, it eliminates some of that symbolism that we have as the mouth being an upward smile. Not always an upward smile, even when somebody is smiling. The other thing is because the lower lip cast a shadow on the chin, there is always the shape of a little bow tie. If you look at anybody sitting next to you, you will find a shadow where the leg, and if you think of that as a bow tie, it usually is a kind of a bow tie shape, and it slants down around the curve of the chin, pointing out the prominence of the chin. So then we can divide into the planes of the face. Well, the planes of the face only give you the idea of what is the furthest out point, the deepest points, because then we think about those laws of light. If light is coming from the side, it cannot possibly get as much light on this side in this deep portion as it does here. There is not, if this is my light side of the face, I have basically three values that I can, I can use on that. I have my highlight, my average color of the local color, and I have a half tone. If I come to the shadow side of the face and there's always one and the other, I need to break that down into two values. I have my dark shadow and I can have a reflected light. So what ends up happening with a lot of portrait work is that if you do not keep that separate, then things take on a different look. It looks like their cousin or their aunt, but not quite them. So you must keep in mind that there is nothing on the shadow side that can be as light as the lightest part, or as dark, no, you, I had it right at the beginning. Nothing on the shadow side can be as light as anything on the light side, and vice versa. So those values are critical. Now, how do you keep all that straight? A couple of tools, you know, we have lots of lots of tools. And what I'm talking about tonight is how a new portrait painter would begin to learn the craft. I'm not saying this is necessarily how I paint nowadays or that, you know, all portrait artists paint like this. But when you are learning the craft, I don't like to see people struggling with drawing at the same time. We can use a photograph that is the same size as what you want to paint, and I always recommend life size or a little bit under life size. And we can use a piece of white Sorrel and actually move the image from, copy it, trace it. You have to be careful because all this is doing is giving you limitations and boundaries. So you can get something on the canvas. So the, the biggest objection I hear is, well, I can't learn to do a portrait because I can't draw. I don't draw hardly ever. Hardly ever. I'm dyslexic. Line drawings, 
make me babble. I can't handle it. So I either work with form, massing in form, or sometimes like this. But this is the way I like to see everybody start out. That little painting that I did there started out from a drawing just like that. This drawing has registration marks on it, A, B, C, D. That is for the purpose. Because when you're doing a portrait, one little line off in one way or the other can make a tremendous difference. So when you are working, one of the tools that we use is we take a piece of Maylar, and we also do a specific tracing of that um, photograph. When I'm working, I can line these registration marks up again, and I can see, oh, I've got that left jaw out too far, or my right eye's a little too wide. So it's a method of keeping yourself in check while you're working. That's one of the biggest tools that we have. Other tools that we like to use, a hymn marker. We can slide this up and down. I can go over and I can measure my painting here, compare it to there, say, oh, I can see what's off there. So, uh, you know, from the sewing store. Little dividers, these are valuable. Can't be replaced. Measure, 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 every way that you can, you need to measure. Value scale. How many instructors have you ever had say, do you pay attention to this? Good thing. The other thing we can do is I will tell you that nine times out of ten when there is a problem with the likeness in a portrait, it has nothing to do with the size. It has to do with the value presentation, which changes the contour image. One thing that you can do is, I have these little holies that I gave you. One of them, the small one is to put on the photograph. The larger one goes over here. And that way, when you isolate, if I want to see if this area right there is as dark as it ought to be, and I put it over there, it is amazing how when you isolate that little area, you can actually determine that right away. And if the value is not right, the painting is not right. And that's where we foul up most of the time. Now, I will tell you that you cannot do it all in a day. You know, I have a little painting here that I fiddled with yesterday and today. Same thing, in varying stages of completion. However, this is almost, but not quite. This is almost, but not quite. But you cannot take it to that final stage until it has set up, until it has dried. Some of the colors used in flesh colors, in particular, will sink in. And you have no way of knowing that until it's dried in a little bit. So it is something that is a process. It does not happen immediately. You can see here, and I'll show you in just a little bit, how I have added a correction. I let the side of the face grow. So now when I bring that back together, I've also got the, the mouth off just a little bit. So this is the way you go back and forth and back and forth. What you don't want to do is allow one correction to then let everything else be measured off of it. So now you have two issues, and then it leads to three. And the next thing you know, everything's kind of water jumped. So you need to monitor as you go. And that's what some of these tools will do. Mirror, black mirror. You can look at it. It will take the familiarity out, make it more abstract when you look at it upside down, and you'll be able to see value errors. Same thing with the regular mirror. The ruler, clear ruler. Measure against this, measure against that. Uh-oh, I'm a little shy or I'm a little over. So you can make the corrections. So painting a portrait's just about like flying an airplane to Hawaii. 99% of the time, you're off course. And then after a while, and several attempts, my golly, here she comes, here it comes, you know. 
for you. Keep your color wheel handy. These acetate sheets to look through, balance the color out. I encourage everybody to do a um, monotone, monochrome um, painting. Let's see. Let's talk about photography for just a quick second before I start. I actually, when I'm painting and I have things all set up, I have these little notes all over. Just things that make me think a little bit because when you get into that mode and you're putting that paint on that canvas, you know how it is. You, you fall in love with it. It just happens. You know, you begin to not be very critical or very analytical because you're just moving along and it feels so good. And then you go, oh, well, um, I need to back up a little bit. And part of that is because of the camera. When the camera feels like it's in focus is when absolutely every edge that it's looking at is in crisp focus. That's not how our eyes see. If I am looking at this as my focus, all of you are fuzzy in the background. And in a degree of fuzziness, the further back you go. So you cannot take a photograph at its word. You have to evaluate it as a tool, but it is not your end-all, be-all. The other thing that photographs do, and copy machines, these are just cheap copy machine uh, things that I'm working off of tonight. Copy machines make reds go red, make yellows a little weird sometimes. So it's giving you an, an idea of good shape and boundaries, but it's not necessarily your best color judgment. Photographs make shadows way too dark, generally, and if it's taken with a flash, it will flatten everything out. So just some kind of little, you know, words to the wise there. So let me show you how, if you notice there, I have down that there is a specific way that we need to um, start a painting. We, everything is in relationship to everything else. So you cannot just independently paint this face without something around it. We have to have the color of the hair. And I'm not saying a finished product, but just some semblance of what's going to be up against what. Because otherwise, you will end up with something that is pale and pasty and washed out. And the reason it's, it's twofold, number one, is what I was just talking about. And number two is that you have not gotten up and stepped away from the painting. Most people view a painting from eight or 10 feet. Where do we paint it from? We like to paint it right here where we're falling in love with this, but then you can't see anything when you step back here because your values are not separated enough. So. I'm gonna be painting to my right, so I don't know you know, unless you switch over to the other side um, while I get started here, nobody's going to be able to see anything that's happening on this side. So I'll give you a few minutes to switch around if you would like. So what I hope that my demonstrations do is always give people the idea that should they want to learn to paint portraits, they can do it. There's no magic to it. It's just, oh, I need a chair. Now, that, that's a painting? Huh? That's a painting? This? Yeah. Yeah. It looks like a photo. Yeah. Now, that's my little granddaughter, granddaughter Juliana. Somebody took her apple and she was pouting about it. So I call that the pout. <laughs> the one thing you want to do is work with an adequate brush of an adequate size. You do not want to be filling around with brushes that are too small. I want my reference material to be right across from where I'm working. I don't want it up here, I don't want it over there. I want to be able to go like this. So 
So this goes right over here. If I want to do a little side trip. Now what we're going to probably be able to get done tonight is a block-in. And that's the first thing and the most, one of the most important things that you ever do anyway. So, I can see when I look at this that some dark areas are in here, in here, in here, and in here. So I want a little bit of that hair defined just in order to give me a contrast for the facial features. So if I would have drawn Marilyn here and, and blocked her out in the plains, I know that there is a plane that goes right here. And that that plane, even though it may not appear to be much of a value difference on this photograph, I know that her head turns right here and goes back. So I have to think about that and accomplish that. My first question I ask is, is it warm or cool? Then I want to know, is it bright or is it dull? Then I'm interested in the color. And I want to know what that value is. But mostly I'm interested in color temperature right in the beginning. The reason, the green, good thing. All right, now you're going to get to that part in just a minute. The reason that there is a green color on this canvas, why I back, or uh, what do you call it? Why I've toned it green. Most of our skin tones under, under um, tones are green. And so by what I'm going to be doing is I am going to be laying in the lights. First I lay in the darks, then I'm going to lay in the lights, and guess what's left over? Those stinky half tones that give us all that trouble. <coughs> the undertones of platinum hair are raw umber, which will gray down as you look at it. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to lay in some semblance of what this clothing is like. This looks black in here. I don't want black against her, so I'm the artist. I'm making it green. The easier, I think the last time I did a demo for the club, I did the gal here on this in the big smile. It's easier to do a big smile because it gives more definition to the face. This has a lot of subtle, blended, when I do this, now I have shadow underneath here. I have uh, highlight casting here. The eyes get a little pooch to them. You cannot have a smiling photograph without a pooch under the eye. You see uh, paintings a lot of times where that's a, a, a problem. And it's like, ah. So it doesn't need to be finished, but I need some idea of how dark that's going to be. Now, it's one thing that happens all the time. You put those cute little registration marks on so you can keep yourself going in the right direction and then you cover them up. So I'm going to try not to do that so I can show you guys how to use it. So that's enough of that. I also want to lay in a little bit of the background only because it needs to be able to reference and mingle with some of these other things. So I don't know. Let's let's have a grayish, bluish kind of background. So 
So this is a blocking in process. This is not a finished painting. We want to set in the crease of the eyelid. That's important and it's unique to everybody. Some people you won't hardly see it at all. Other people you will. I want to set in an example, just an example of fleshy color where the eyebrows are. They're not finished, it's a placeholder. Marilyn is obviously not a natural blonde. So then I'm going to use a warmer color, I'm going to use burnt sienna deep, to do that inside of the eye and the tear duct. The tear duct, if you look at your neighbor, is very fleshy. So it is not, not dark. There's a little sparkle of light in it that if you get that far, you can put it in. But for now, we want it to be red. I want to outline the iris of the eye. The shape of the whites of the eye are what tell you what position the head is in. If I am down, looking at you in an upward direction, the whites of my eye have a completely different shape than if I move up like this or up like this that will tell the story of how the person is looking. So what I'm trying to do here is show you some technique, some method. We are not going to end up with a, a great painting or any of that business with the time amount that we have, but I, hopefully you'll go home encouraged with the idea that should you ever want to, I'm going to drop a pupil in there, should you ever want to learn to paint, you certainly can paint okay, portraits. All right, the mouth, the darkest line, that is about the only place that I will use burnt umber by itself with just a tad bit of alizarin crimson in it because I want that area to be warm. Fleshy areas are always very warm. You're going to have warmth where you have bony prominences, nose, cartilage in your ear, and in the lip area. The darkest is right in the corner. It's wrong. And there's nothing in this line that can go on the light side of the face and vice versa. So this separates it. However, 
if I'm working and I say this is far too yellow, far too orange, I can move right up here, pick up a little red, and now I have made it pinker. So no matter what flesh tone I am working with, whether it's somebody from an Indian or a Caucasian or whatever, I can use the same palette for depending on how I mix it up. All right. We want to set some limitations of the mouth, but we want to do it in a flesh color. We don't want to put lipstick on yet. So what I'm doing is setting my boundaries. I know I cannot go outside of this boundary, and I have to look very closely when we get to that point to see where the variations in the values in that lip are. Continuing to just block in the boundaries here. This will all be covered up. All right, now if I am looking at the face, one of the things that I need to do is get the darks set in. And if I look, the darkest part on this face is right here in the curve of this eye socket. So we're going to put that in, and it goes on down the side of the nose, and there's a little part of the uh, shadow that's cast. Now, I see that right over on this side, we have a really, really dark, prominent spot right here. Not dark enough. Not dark enough. That will be lost. That's better. Where else do I see prominent darks? Right here. And we need to make sure we keep those fresh. This is going to come down a little bit more. Now, on the dark part of the side of the face, there is always, in these areas right here, where that plane comes down, you're going to have a turn. Any place you have a turn, it oftentimes picks up a little light. So this area must be in shadow. And wow, is that dark? It is. It is, but let's look. Everything that goes on will be lighter when we start mixing things together. This color here is cooler than it is over here. So I'm going to deep reach down and I'm going to get a little bit of blue to cool that. You can turn an edge by changing temperature oftentimes as much as you can by value. And that's a beautiful way to develop facial skin tones. You notice there's a little bit of shadow all the way around. It's a cast shadow back up off of that dark sweater and eventually we'll do some more work with that. We have a little bow tie area right here. That's going to help define the chin. We have a little facial crease right here. Present on this side, not there. Just the way she's put together. We always know that wherever the skull turns backwards, we're going to have more shadow because that is going away from us. As it goes away, you're going to have a 
change in the value. A little bit of flesh showing up here. That's underneath those bangs, but we know it's there. primary darks on her face. The rest of it is mid-tones. Now, what you want to do here is make sure that we have approximately the same value. And although that looks awful garish there, you can see we're pretty much on track. Now what we're going to do is we're going to lay in the lights. And when we lay in the lights, what's going to happen is that what we're left with is the halftones. And the halftones are the pesky people that, you know, we have to hassle with for the most part. Now, when I talk about lights, I'm not talking about the highlights. I'm just talking about the lights of the normal skin tone. And one thing that people make a mistake with is not having enough color in a face. Faces are very colorful, and we tend to want to wash them out because we have this idea that that's the way it's supposed to be. So if I'm looking at the light, I see that the main light part of the forehead is right in this area. And I'm making things a bit bright and a bit overdone so I can demonstrate notice right above her brow it gets a little cooler and a little lighter right here. Up here it gets a little lighter but it's a little warmer, pinker in that area and right along where her hairline turns. going to have a fairly bright cheek here that has a definite shape. We will get that shadow under the eye in a little bit. The nose, if you isolate the nose, the nose essentially has the same value as the cheeks, but, and it has three planes, a top plane, two side planes. But we have the idea, because it comes forward, that it should be lighter. It really is not. There's the values along the nose. There's the values along the cheek. If you isolate it, you can tell that. So the nose needs to have a significant amount of color. The two side walls start out fairly dark. any turf on my brush the whole time I'm painting. I wipe <coughs> and it does not bother me if a little bit of an adjacent color is coming through there. The fleshy part of the nose right around in here, very red, very red. If you notice right here, and I'm just going to skim across it, is where her cartilage breaks. On 
on this side of the nose. That was a mistake. This is actually much cooler on this side. If you look at it, you can tell. So warmth on this side where the sun's coming from, cooler there. We always establish a value first and go back and do um, temperature correction later. Now where we talked about that pear, it's going to be quite rosy underneath there. And so we're just going to go ahead and put that in now. That follows up and we will transfer it up there with our brush in a bit. On this side, the rosiness follows down more, just barely to the mouth. And we always have some rosiness on the chin. <laughs> The forehead is basically a yellow zone, the mid face from ear to ear, a red zone, fleshy and red, cool. If you look at your neighbor, where that cheek turns, it always gets cooler. So you're always going to have more blue tones in the flesh on the bottom of the face. <coughs> squinting is, and I have not been squinting much at all tonight because I'm turning around and I'm talking and I'm not in my own element. But squinting is the answer to portraiture too. If you do not squint to see values and open to see color, then you're missing out <coughs> on it. Now if you look on this light side of the face, the lip is also light right up against the nostril. We'll put that little shadow in later, but it comes down and curves over the cupid bow on the lip. These little things are what make her humanoid. Things that we do later are going to be what make her Marilyn. Now this is the cooler flesh tone because if I squint, I can tell that from here down, she is mostly a cool tone. She's cool between her eyes too. The chin also has three zones, a top, a middle, and a bottom. Now that bottom is going to turn under needs to be a little cooler as I go farther down. That might be a little too much, but we'll see. So, we get hung up on the little things sometimes, but stop and think about it. Somebody can hand you your high school yearbook, and you can say, who's that third person? Do you remember? And you'll say, oh, that was Joanne Faber. Why? You can't. It's the size of a dime. You can't see anything, but you know the general large shapes of her face. So we get hung up on the little details. But really, it's as much important that we know the larger picture also. just about ready to come to a little bit of the fun part here. Once you lay in a dark and develop a platform, then you can actually use that to build
color on. We want to keep the color soft and shadows go on thin. Lights go on thicker. We're going to move these lights around. I don't know what color Marilyn's eyes were. I looked it up and there were all kinds of stories, but we're just going to make her a trial run. The top of the pupil runs right in because of the shadow that lays on top of it. The whites of the eyes are never white. They actually go in this dirty greenish color. And then later we will make that eyeball have a rounded shape. And while you're doing this, you're paying particular attention that you do not lose the shape of that white of the eye. Because that tells the story of where the eye is looking. So we're just blocking not anything that's set in stone. It's all movable. It's oil paint. We can do it over and over again. That big smudge I just made in there, well, we'll fix it. We need some dark in this crease of the eye. We'll put the eyeshadow on it in a bit. We have to roll that up in a little bit to get it to match. Ears are very warm, very warm. We'll tone it down later, but we need that warmth in there. <coughs> what happens next is that once I lay in a few more areas of Color, we are going to start not blending, but sculpting this together. There's always a little prominence here that catches. Later, we actually put in the little area where we get the curve of the mouth going back. If we don't get it going back, it will look very bizarre. It will look flat. In order to get it to curve back, we need these little triangles. If you look at your neighbor, we all have this little shadow triangles that go right through there. And we'll put those in a little bit. show you the technique. So at this point, what we're going to do, once you have laid in your lights and your darks, what that really leaves is wherever there's green, that's a half tone. So now what we want to do is we want to evaluate whether that half tone is warm or whether it's cool. Down in the lower part of the face, the half tone that connects this dark and this light is cooler. The whole part of the face down here is cooler.
tone up here, you can tell, gets a little warmer. We don't have to fill in all the gaps because we're going to sculpt this together with our brush. The paint that you put on does at this stage, it's almost like paint by the Yeah, I'm putting on a, a, a block in, and yes, I suppose in a way it is kind of like a paint Until you actually blend it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So once you get this established, much better than what I have here, obviously, you're going to take a dry, clean brush and start moving it around. We are not blending it away. No, 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 no. Because what happens is if you get too carried away with blending, and I brought a photograph. Uh, Start, I'm going to look and evaluate. All right, this area right here actually goes up into there. It goes up into here. It goes up <coughs> into the hairline. And it comes down a little bit. This area here. I'm going to bring over. Sometimes you have to add more paint, sometimes, and I know I'm going to have to make this turn here where her temple is. So you're wiping and touching and moving color. You are not blending it all out. Later, once it sets up, then you can start blending things around. And you'll lose your landmarks. And then when it's dry, you come back and you will add color in to establish the form again. It's a back and forth, and back and forth. If I see that half tone actually comes up over the brow on that side, so I can push it over there. This is just the first application of paint. So we have a lot of painting to do, but this is laying in the block in that gives some semblance of a humanoid form. Later she gets to become Marilyn. I wish we had time to talk about into another, you share this color with down here, and before you know it, you've got a nice humanoid person going, and you work on it two, three, four times, and you start getting it looking like her. Then you turn it upside down because that takes you out of the, and you say, oh my gosh, the left part of the nose, what's wrong with that? You know, you couldn't see it upright. You turn it this way. Um, you move it, you look at it through, your value finder, you do measurements, and you actually write these things down. I make a copy of just an oval face, and I do a line right here, and I have little things that say, I too wide, check measurement here. Value, crazy lady, you know, um, so it then, it, it's so it's analytical. It really is truly very analytical. So anyway, that's enough. That's enough.
funny. Yeah, there you go. We could do that sometime. That would be a lot We could do that fun sometime. Thank you. Focused in North St. Louis County, Northside Art Association is a nonprofit 501c3 arts organization that serves local artists through community exposure, networking, education, and peer interaction. Learn more about Northside Art Association at www.northsideartassociation.org.